Thank you everyone for joining me this afternoon. So my name is Dr. Nicole Hawkins. I'm the Director of Clinical Services here at the Center for Change. Um, I have been at the Center for 18 years. I run all the body image groups and I guess another thing to know about me is I'm recovered from anorexia and bulimia for about 25, I'm getting old, 26 years. And so that is kind of what's brought on this um, talk I'm going to do today. I think a lot of the time um, the patients look to me for the answers because they figure, well, you've recovered, Nicole. And, and so I can tell them that what worked for me and, and what definitely helped me in recovery. But I wanted to see what has helped my patients. And I wanted to get an idea looking at my patients that have recovered over the years, what the key things were. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's see. It didn't move. Oh, okay, so right here. Sorry, I'm just having technical. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay, so um, what I wanted to see is why do patients get better, what my patients have taught me about recover, recovery, and then I wanted to talk about some therapeutic interventions to support recovery. So these are some of the questions I had is, is number one, why do some patients seem to get better really fast and, and by really fast I mean within a year I have some patients that are back engaged in their life doing great where I think for those of you that have worked in the industry for a while you know we have patients that have struggled for years and on their in and out of facilities it's been a long journey for them and so does it depend on if the person has a strong desire to get better is it willpower is it how much they're willing to fight do some just try harder than others so these are some of the questions I had and and I was going to kind of analyze with the patients. So what I want to talk about today is kind of learning the key obstacles and barriers that patients reported kept them stuck in their eating disorder, identify the critical factors and behavioral changes that enabled patients to start moving towards a recovered life, and then understand what motivates patients to truly change and embrace um, a life free of their eating disorder. So this was by no means uh, a clinical investigation I did. It was, it was a survey I did of recovered patients. So I emailed, I reached out to 60 patients, and you can see my response rate was, was pretty good. 48 patients that were recovered and had been in recovery. They had to be in recovery for at least one year to participate in my survey. So I got 48 that said they were recovered and were doing pretty well. And so they either emailed me responses or if they were coming for our alumni event, they brought me um, just a written response. On average, the length of their response, responses were about eight typed pages. So they took a lot of time and they answered the questions thoroughly and, and they really, I think it was cool for them, they really wanted to give a voice about how they recovered and what worked for them. And then my ultimate goal when I collected all this data, and, and this was a goal I set like many years ago, is I was going to write a book, and I was going to write a book about recovery, so we can all see how well that went, um, because I have no book, but I do have a webinar, so we'll be talking about the results here in this webinar. So the average length of time in recovery was 33 months, so they, they'd said they'd been in recovery about 33 months. The average age at the time was 25, so you can see that a lot of the patients that participated in this survey were younger when they were in treatment, and so now they were, you know, 25, and on average, I think the age range when I did, did this was eight, was honestly 19, I think I maybe had one 18-year-old up to age 40, so that was kind of the range of the ages. And then all the patients in this survey had received inpatient or residential care. So they were able to identify nine critical factors for success. And so I think it's going to be interesting as we look at the, the nine factors that help them recover, you're going to see almost a mirroring effect of the, the factors that were a burden or prevented their recovery. So these are the nine factors, and I'm going to talk about each one individually, but I have them on, on this slide because I, I rank ordered them. So based on their response and the coding I did of their responses, um, this is the rank order of importance for the recovered patients on what mattered the most. So let's start with number one. So consistency and structure. So what they said, it was critical for them to have consistency in their schedule. And 
when when you think about it, if if we take a patient that's bulimic or that's engaging in over exercising, and maybe they're spending all afternoon binging and purging, and then going to the gym. If we pull the eating disorder out of their life, there's a lot of free time. So helping them come up with a schedule, helping them come up with a plan. I like to sometimes um, torment our day patients, and I go up to the unit on a Friday afternoon, and I ask them, who can show me their written plan for the weekend? And nine times out of ten, no one has a written plan, and they should know I'm coming, so they should be prepared. But the reason I ask them this is because I tell them if they don't have a plan, they will engage in the eating disorder. So it's critical that they're outlining structure. But you can see in the picture I posted, it's not about perfection. And knowing that just because we have a plan, it doesn't mean it's going to work, but I need them to have a plan. The next thing they said was having a meal plan. So again, I don't want them journaling and writing everything they're going to eat and what they're going to eat and how much they're going to eat. But I do like them to have an idea, and I do like them to make some commitments on when they're going to be eating breakfast, snack, lunch, and maybe it's a window of time between 7 and 9 a.m. They'll be eating breakfast, maybe between noon and 2 they'll be eating lunch. But, but that, that is written down, and there is, you know, some consistency in that schedule. They said staying busy, but not too busy. Our patients love to be um, busy. You know, here on programming on the weekends, intentionally we like to give them some downtime because I like to see how they're going to cope with less structure, how they're going to occupy themselves if the first thing they want to do is, is go to behaviors. And so they acknowledged for themselves, too, having some of that downtime was critical. The next one they said was setting small obtainable goals. I had a patient um, in my office two weeks ago. She um, was coming in for an assessment and wanted to see an outpatient therapist, and she told me that she had been purging every day for the last two years. She had not had a day behavior-free in two years. So I guess I was just a fabulous therapist because when we left the session and she set her goal, she told me her goal for the week was to have no purging episodes. To me, that's not a small obtainable goal. So educating them on, you know, maybe maybe we're just decreasing the amount of purging you're doing every day. And especially with binge eaters, if you want to engage them in therapy, you have to set small obtainable goals that you know they can reach if you want them to come back the next week for an outpatient visit. So it's really critical to get their ideas for goals, but then also maybe help them dial it back to what's realistic. The next one they identified was making plans for the future. A lot of my patients are terrified to make plans for the future and then to verbalize those plans. Because what if they don't do it? You know, what if they set a goal? What if they're like me and they set a goal to write a book and then you don't do it and now all your colleagues are asking you where your book is? I mean, that's embarrassing, right? So having them, though, make plans, talk about what their future goals are. And when we get to some of the later... Um, factors that hindered their recovery. I'm going to talk more about goal setting and some of the, the outlines I have for them. So the next one they identified, and again in order, was number two, honesty with myself and others. So honesty is a very critical thing they identified in recovery. And I like to talk to my patients about how they can lie to, to everyone around them, but they can no longer lie to themselves. And so one of the things they talked about is learning to talk openly about my flaws and my inabilities. For me, it's a good marker if I have a patient that's, that's willing to start talking about their behaviors with their family, if they're willing to start talking about their tips and their tricks and how they got away with things. I think that becomes critical in their recovery. The next one is, you know, they said just being honest with my team, my family. When I work with adolescents, and especially when we're trying to find out patient therapists, I like them to interview one or two therapists, um, well, two or three, actually. I like them to interview multiple therapists and find who they're going to be comfortable with, who they feel they can be honest with. Because it's one thing to be in outpatient treatment, but it's another thing um, to have a therapist they trust and someone they, they feel that they can be honest with. And, and you know, I do believe with, with my therapist, I supervise about 20 therapists, and a lot of times if patients want therapists, 
changes, I'm, I'm often pretty willing to grant those because I want the patient to feel like they have someone they can trust, that they can be honest with, that they can be open with. The next one they identified was reaching out for support. The most important thing they said under this area was continuing with my outpatient treatment team. I don't know how many dietitians we have on the line. Um, I sure appreciate the work you do, and you're a critical, critical part of the outpatient team. But what I find with my patients is no offense to my poor dietitians, but they're the first one voted off the treatment team. They're the first person that my patients start to say they don't need to see. And a lot of the reason is, is they claim that, number one, maybe insurance doesn't pay for it. But then, number two, they, they claim they know everything. And they don't need to see a dietitian anymore. There's nothing new a dietitian can teach them. And so I think it is critical that we keep them seeing their dietitian. They need that, that accountability. They need that support. And then if we jump down the list, the next thing to be voted off the island is taking their medications. A lot of times my patients, they don't want the stigma of being on medication. They go off their medications. The problem is, is they don't even tell anyone they go off their medications. So many times when we have adolescents readmit, they'll tell us that they went off their medications two to three months prior to their family, even knowing they went off their medication. And these are diligent parents that are really watching these um, young women, and they're, they're still tricking them going off their medications. The research tells us, and this is the clinical research if we're looking at depression, we know that if patients leaving 24-hour care stay on their medications for at least one year consistently, there's an 80% decrease in having a de depressive episode that next year. So it's critical for them, but again, this is something that if we're not asking them if they're taking their medication, a lot of times I get, maybe not complacent, but I'll just say, well, you're on Prozac, right? You're on 40 milligram. I just ask them, but I don't ask them if they're actually taking it. So we need to ask them, so this is what you're prescribed. Are you taking it? The other one they said on this reaching out for support is having a voice and having an opinion. I feel like this for my own recovery was a critical critical factor. I was the student that was the straight-A student but would never raise my hand in class, would never have an opinion. Because what if I had an opinion and it was wrong? What if people disagreed? What if people judged me for that opinion? And so a powerful part of my recovery was just learning to have a voice. The problem I had, though, is when I learned that I finally had a voice and I started using my voice, I thought that maybe people would actually then listen. And so maybe learning, and I teach my patients, just because you use your voice doesn't mean people are going to listen and it doesn't mean things are going to change, but we're still going to do the exercise of you having an opinion and um, using your voice. The, the other one on this section they said was making new friends. This is a big struggle for a lot of my patients. By the time they come into treatment, they have burned every bridge they have. They have alienated themselves from their peer group. They have very few friends, and that takes a long time. And, and I, again, I tell them, I use myself as, as an example. When I recovered from my eating disorder, I had zero friends. I had lots of acquaintances, but I had no friends. And it took me a good year just to make a couple friendships. And so I talked to them about that. And so then we go on to the next one that is joining groups or clubs. For a lot of them, if they're introverts and they're shy, making friends is hard anyway. So I like to put them in environments where it maybe is a little easier. They can make those connections that aren't surrounded by eating disorder people. And so having them as part of their therapeutic assignment, joining groups, joining clubs. Okay, so number five you'll see a social media. Now, if any of you have heard me speak in the past, you'll know that I'm pretty against social media is a positive um, means for recovery. However, this is from, you know, the mouths of my patients and recovered people, and they said social media was very critical in their recovery, and out of the nine things they identified, it was number five. So they said Facebook, Instagram, you know, back then when I did the survey, Tumblr was big recovery blogs were big. I could give you a whole spill on my opinion about recovery blogs, 
but they they did find them very helpful. And what they said is they felt like they were not alone. They made connections with people that understood their issues. So I think we do need to listen to our patients. Um, social media could possibly be a very positive thing for them. But I think we need to talk to them about the sites they're on. We need to ask them if it is helpful for them. And we maybe have to have them set some limits themselves on how much they will be on social media. So number four, they said, was sharing my story. And I love they said sharing my story, and multiple patients said this, with people that earn the right to hear it. So for so many of my patients, they leave treatment, and they feel like they then have to be an open book, and they have to tell everyone their life history, and they have to tell their college professor that they've been in eating disorder treatment, and they have to tell their volleyball coach, and you name it. And so having them learn that they can share their story with people that they want to share it with. And then recognizing that my story makes me strong and not weak. And then the other thing they said is realizing if people truly knew me, that that is actually a real relationship. And so having them share their vulnerabilities, have them share their fears. The next one they said that was very helpful for them was speaking to groups about their eating disorder. I have a lot of my patients ask me, well, how quickly can I get out speaking? And I really want um, to be out speaking. And so what I suggest to them is that they're at least one year in recovery before they start speaking in groups. And then I usually like them to, to at least sit down with a therapist or a professional and talk about what they'd like to speak on. You know, I've had sometimes alumni come and speak in a group, and if they haven't spoke in front of patients before, you know, they may not know that it's maybe not a good idea to talk about their weight or their lowest weight or how many laxatives they took. And so I do like them to be educated on maybe some of the do's and don'ts if they're going to go do some speaking to groups about their recovery. So number six, they said, was um, creating meaning in their life and their recovery through service. Um, I was an expert at volunteer work in my recovery, and, and one reason I volunteered uh, so much is because I thought I had no skills and I was incompetent, so I thought no one would hire me, so at least I could work for free. But I found by um, doing volunteer work, it really forced me out of my own comfort zone, and I started, you know, relating to people more and, and, and pushing myself and, and realizing I had value. And that's exactly what the patients in, in the survey said themselves. And so one of the things we do while they're in treatment here is we have them go do service projects every week. And if your patients, you know, if they're not able to go volunteer or go spend a couple hours volunteering or doing service outside their home, even, you know, writing letters to, to the military. We, we had um, our patients send care um, packages to active military um, soldiers and anything like that that you kind of can feel like they can be giving and doing a little bit outside themselves I think is excellent. The next one they identified as spirituality. So what they said is discovering my passions and my interests. So many of them, you know, uh, we do a group where we ask them about their, their passions. And, and they honestly will say, I have no passions. I have no interests. Um, I actually like exercising and running, and that would be my passion. So I think helping them acknowledge that the eating disorder takes many of their passions and their interests away. And so maybe part of determining what their new passions and interests are or, or putting them in those situations, determining, helping them determine what they like. The next one they said was exploring my spirituality. You know, we're non-denominational here, and so it, it could be their spirituality is connecting with nature. It could be whatever it is for them. And so they said that was a critical thing for them. The next one, some of my patients and a lot of my patients say, just actually going to church. A lot of our patients completely withdraw from going to, any, going to church. They feel unworthy. They feel like they should not go. Um, and so for a lot of them, they just said just walking through the doors again. And then again, they also said, you know, determining my relationship with God. And for some of our patients, they, they don't have a relate. 
they don't have a God. Maybe their God is a tree, like I said, or, or going for one of my patients. That would be sitting by a river and watching the water. So whatever it is for them, talking to them about that, helping them rediscover that. And so again, they, they identify that as number seven. Number eight, um, I think this was a pretty big one for a lot of the patients. And they said, letting go of unhealthy people in my life. And um, I stopped expecting other people to change. I've heard this a lot from my patients, and, and I'm sure you guys can all relate that you're sitting with your client in your office, and they're, they're saying, well, if my mom doesn't change, I'm not going to change. If my dad doesn't stop his behaviors, I'm not going to change. Or if my husband doesn't get help for his addiction, I'm not going to change. And so for a lot of my patients, they said, I just need to change regardless of what the person I'm with regardless of what they're doing. The next one they said is, is staying away from predatory people. I do a whole group with them where we kind of look at maybe, not necessarily predatory people, but we look at unhealthy relationships they get into in their eating disorder. Whether they're with a rescuer who wants to save them, if they're, if they're with another co-addict, if they're with a codependent, kind of looking at their history of relationships and analyzing those and looking at their past and you know I talk to them about sick attracts sick and so it doesn't mean any relationship they're in and their eating disorder is doomed but if they're going to move to a healthy place whoever they're in a relationship with has to be willing to do the same thing and then seeking out healthy people a lot of my patients say well I'm afraid I'm intimidated by those people they would never want to be my friends and, and I feel better basically if I hang out with you know, the, the people in addictions, I feel better, I feel safer, they don't judge me. But having them truly seek out healthy people start to increase kind of the percentage of healthy people in their life. And then a lot of my patients said, I decided to recover for my family or for my future family. And I know for me that was a personal motivator. I thought, you know, I can't, I can't um, have children, I can't be a mother, I can't get married with this eating disorder and I knew that was a very large commitment for me that if I was going if those things I truly val I valued in life and I wanted that I needed to have recovery first and so that's again if you look at the age range of my sample it was a younger sample size and so for a lot of them just thinking about I do want kids in the future I want to have a family I value this you know this is what I'm gonna pursue now I think it's pretty fascinating that self-care was number nine on the list. Um, but what they said was actually making slash scheduling time for myself. And as sad as that is, that's how I have to do self-care. I have to actually plan it and put it in my phone to do it. Because I guess for me, it is last on my list too. Except for when I find myself in a crisis, or really stressed out, then I think, oh, I need to do self-care. Well, if I'd been doing self-care all along, maybe I wouldn't have got myself into that crisis. And that's kind of the same thing the patient shared. And a lot of our patients are these kind of type A personalities, and they just feel like they don't have time for self-care. So they said starting to learn to care for my own needs before others journaling affirmations. Um, if some of you have heard me speak um, in the past, I talk about an affirmation exercise that I love to do with the patients. So if you're running a group or even for individual, you could do this. There's lots of websites you can go on where you can um, print out positive affirmations and they'll literally have 600. So I print out um, probably at least 500 positive affirmation statements for my patients. Then I have them go through, and I usually do this in a group setting. I have them go through the pages, and then I have them um, write down the ones that kind of touch them, the ones that they like. So they have to write them out by hand, and then they have to cut them out, and then I give them little cardboard boxes, and they decorate the boxes. They cut things out of magazines, they put pictures of their kids or their family, they mod podge it, and then they put the 365 affirmations in that box and that becomes their exercise that every morning they take out that affirmation. I've had a couple other patients that have taken 365 um, post-it notes. They write an affirmation on each post-it note. They put the post-it notes um, up on their mirrors or up on their bedroom wall and every day they take a post-it 
note down. And, and again, they've said that this has just kind of been such a joyous way to start their morning, and it just kind of keeps them on track. So that's an easy exercise they can do, and they usually um, really enjoy it. And then the last thing they said is learning to love myself. And so those that kind of wraps up the nine um, critical factors they identified that help them recover. So now we're going to move to the obstacles or the barriers. And so they identified eight. And as I talk about these, you're going to see some that are very similar. Um, and so we'll talk about interventions for, for each one. So they said by far the number one thing that got in their way the most was negative body image. Now, I don't know if they just said that because I'm the body image teacher and they're trying to tell me I did a bad job. I don't know. But that was the number one thing they identified. So they said, always wanting to change my body. So I do five groups a week where I run body image groups. And usually I'll ask them every couple weeks, I'll say, raise of hands. And I do this with the residential patients. They're getting ready to discharge and go back into the care of you fine people. So I ask them, I say, Raise of hands, how many of you are planning on losing weight or wanting to change your body when you discharge? Almost all of them raise their hands. So they all still want to change their bodies. They all still kind of have this hope that they can change their body and still recover. So what I try to teach them is I recognize you want to change your body. I recognize that you're going to have thoughts every day to want to change your body for a long, long time. Just because that thought is there doesn't mean you have to act on it, doesn't mean you have to listen to it. You just acknowledge that it's there and you move on. And so I tell them, again, it's about accepting your body, not wanting to change it. The next one they said is the scale. So, you know, every morning when they're in treatment here, we don't let them see their weight, but they get up and they take their temperature, they take their vitals, and they get on their the scale. Now, I don't know how many of you at home get up every morning and take your temperature, unless maybe you're trying to get pregnant and you're trying to plot it, but how many of you get up and take your temperature and take your vitals and then get on the scale every morning? So I try to talk to them about they don't need to get on the scale every morning. They don't need to know their weight. But I completely understand that need to know and, and wanting that control. And so I do talk to them about options with that. And so when we get to the next slide, I'm going to talk about interventions for that and, and the interventions I use with them wanting to know their weight and wanting to have a scale and, and wanting to have multiple scales in their house. The next one they said is refusing to maintain a normal body weight. So these were patients that kind of knew where their body weight should be they knew where professionals wanted it to be, but they were just hoping it could stay at a naturally lower place. And so they said, obviously, that they tried it their way, and they learned that it didn't work, and they were not able to recover at that lower weight. And then they said, hating their body and avoiding situations due to my body. So let's get to the interventions for a minute here. So the number one intervention I like to use is clothing challenges. So the first one I like to do is what I call cleaning out their closets. So a lot of my patients, they literally say, well, I have my fat clothes, my skinny clothes, I have my eating disorder clothes, however they label it. I tell them, I want all those clothes gone. I want the clothes that fit you now. And if you don't have clothes that fit you now, I need you to go out and get some new clothes. Whether it's you're going to, you know, consignment stores, cheaper clothes, if you don't have the resources, I want you to have clothes that you feel comfortable in and get rid of all those other clothes in your closet. And so then we do body image kind of challenge days where this is where I assess what are their rules about clothes. Do they have rules about what color they wear? Do they have rules about what fabric type they wear? Do they have rules about what kind of bra do they wear? Do they wear push-up bras? Do they wear sports bras? Do they sleep in a sports bra? I even have asked them, I assess if they have rules about how they wear their hair. How, you know, does their hair have to be a certain length to make their face look thinner? I ask them about if they have to wear makeup or no makeup. A lot of my patients that don't wear makeup, 
if you actually ask them why they don't wear makeup, a lot of times you get a very interesting answer. They'll tell me, because I feel so ugly, I feel like I would look like an ugly girl trying to look pretty, and it would call more attention to me. So for those patients, it may be the challenge is, is that they have to wear makeup for a couple days. For my patients that are obsessed with wearing makeup and wouldn't go anywhere without makeup, then the challenge is for them to not wear makeup for a couple days. So really individualizing, talking to them about their rules. Will they wear shorts? Will, will they wear Levi's? How will they buy their clothes? So many of my patients will not walk into a clothing store. They will only shop online. And then they just return everything online because they won't even go in a clothing store. So those are some of the things. And then we set a challenge day, whether it's Tuesdays or Saturdays. They pick the day, and I do this with my outpatients too. They pick the day, and then on that day, they do their, their challenge, whether it's I'm going to wear shorts for an hour or I'm only going to wear one layer on my upper half. I'm not going to wear a sweater all day or I'm not going to wear a large baggy sweatshirt or I'm actually going to wear jeans. So kind of having them do those challenge days. The next one I call is limiting opportunities. I do um, entire groups where I just talk about what triggers them. So I like to come up with their 10 top triggers. Whether it's a family member, maybe it's the media, maybe it's feeling full, maybe it's um, being tired, maybe it's being around people that diet. Figuring out what their top triggers are, and then I have them rank those in a hierarchy of the most triggering to the least triggering. And then on that list of 10, I try to figure out what they can actually avoid. So there was a research study done. It's, it's an older study. It was done about 12 years ago, but they identified top triggers for women with eating disorders. The number one trigger was looking in the mirror, and on average they say women look in the mirror 17 times a day. So maybe for a patient we could decrease the amount they look in mirrors. Maybe they could cover up some of their mirrors. But, you know, the number two trigger was getting on the scale. So for me, that's a trigger my patients can avoid. So I, I try to look at the triggers they can avoid versus the ones they can't and help them start working on avoiding some of those triggers. So number three, and this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of the scale, I have weekly weigh-ins with a professional. So a lot of my patients, they really want to know their weight, and a lot of them have an idea of what their weight is. And so we kind of have a zone. So I have a green zone where they kind of have an idea of where their weight is, and then they have a yellow zone and a red zone. So then when they go in and they get weighed by their professional, or if they get weighed by me, if they're an IOP or a PHP or an outpatient, I will tell them, you're in your green zone, you're doing fine. I don't tell them an exact number, but they know kind of around the range, you know, within five to seven pounds, they have an idea of where their weight is. And so, for example, last week, one of my PHP patients was in the yellow zone on the negative. She was losing weight. She was in the yellow zone. So I said, okay, you're in your yellow zone. What is your self-correction plan? Because you're in your yellow zone. Well, she knows what her self-correction plan is. It means she has to eat an extra snack every day, and she has to decrease her exercise. So if she was in her red zone, that may mean she needs to eat and she has to either have a boost or another snack on top of that. She loses all exercise. All her meals have to be with family members. So I kind of have these contracts or these plans set up with them beforehand where we just know. And so there's no judgment. It's just like, okay, you're in your yellow zone. What's our plan to get out of it? So that I like to, ideally, if I can, I turn that over to the dietitians. They weigh them. They let them know their zone. And then I help come up with um, interventions along with the dietitians to help support them get back up into their green zone. So, or if they, or if I have a binge eater and they're gaining weight, they need to know that information as well. And so it's being very transparent, but without talking about the specifics and a, without them knowing those numbers every single day. So the next one is avoid avoiding. This is where I like to talk to them and, and really determine what they're missing out on their life with negative body image. Are they not going on dates? Are they not going to social events? Are they not going to swimming pools? Are they missing kids' birthday parties? Whatever it is. And again, we come up with the things they're avoiding the most and what's causing them the most distress. 
Um, this summer I was working with a, a mom of four kids. Her kids were wanting to go to the pool. She just couldn't do it. She would start crying. So one day she even took the kids to the pool. She, she paid and then she, she left. And so for her, that was causing her a lot of distress. So we kind of set that as our number one goal, is to get her to the pool that summer and let her have fun with her kids. And so to find the things in their life where their body image is hurting them the most and start targeting those behaviors. Okay, the next one they, they identified is the number two thing that really hindered their recovery is not wanting to be controlled. And this is what they said, wanting to do it on my own, being stubborn, not letting other people help me, thinking I could do it on my own. Um, you know, and I have a patient that's discharging. She's not my personal patient, but she's discharging tomorrow, and she's been here, and she wants, she doesn't want an aftercare team. I'm getting her one anyway, but she says, I've learned everything I need to know. I think I can do it on my own. And I thought, well, good luck with that. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But, you know, a lot of them... They really do. They, they think, I've been in 24-hour care. I, I think I know everything now. And so they, they have this confidence and maybe a lot of fear about it too. And they said not letting other people help me and then refusing to have a treatment team or refusing to have a full treatment team. So again, a lot of times they like to see a therapist, but they don't want to be on medication. They don't want to see a dietitian. So I think, it, you know, for the therapists that are, listening, you know, I think we all can, we all know how important it is to have that full team supporting us. And so I always just require them if they're going to work with me, if they have an eating disorder and it's active, they need to be seen a dietitian as well. So these are what I call the leave me alone interventions. So number one is defining what structure is needed and not being alone. I have a day patient right now that she struggles from 7 p.m. at night to 10 p.m. at night. Um, that is when she's actively engaged in binging and purging. That is the hardest time of the day for her. So our interventions are that maybe she um, is at Barnes & Noble for the first hour, then maybe she goes the next hour, she goes to the library, or maybe she goes to the mall because she doesn't have any friends. She's definitely isolated herself. So I try to find environments where if she's doing things alone, it doesn't seem odd or weird. Um, most recently, she's been volunteering at the animal shelter. She takes dogs for walks um, after programming. So just finding things they can do where they're not alone. And again, if, if they have family they can be around, that's fabulous. But really looking at their day and when do they need that structure, when do they need that support, do they have people they can eat meals with. And so often they tell me, I don't need a babysitter, Nicole. And I say, I know you don't need a babysitter, but I just want you to have someone there to help you and help you be accountable. Even if they're not even asking you, talking to you about your meal or how you're doing, just having someone there um, can be really helpful for these patients. The next one is setting goals. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, so I like them to set weekly goals, monthly goals, the next year and the next five years. And again, I tell them we're not living by these goals, but I like them to be more future focused. And I like them to think about what their life would, they would like it to be, um, how they would like it to be without the eating disorder, and start kind of thinking about their future instead of just about the eating disorder. The next one, and sometimes they give me a little pushback on this one, is daily and weekly family support check-ins. So for all my patients, no matter what their age is, no matter what level of care, I like them to do daily accountability check-ins with someone. So whether it's a husband, it's a parent, it's a friend, it's a therapist, they are doing nightly check-ins where they're just saying how their day was in terms of behaviors, if they were behavior free, if they followed their meal plan. Um, so with my patient I was giving the example with earlier that doesn't have much of a support she has to email me every night and has to be accountable to me. I tell her I'm not going to check it till the morning, but I expect it's going to be there and that you've done that email to me. The, the next thing I like them to do are more in-depth weekly family check-ins, either if it's with their, their husband or their parents, that 
each week, they maybe do an hour check-in. If they're in family therapy, it's a perfect time to do that. Um, and they, they talk about how overall the week did. The parents can ask questions. Um, you know, my patients can give feedback on how the parents could help them or what the parents are doing wrong, how they're annoying them. But really getting everyone to have open, honest communication. Um, and for my patients that have done this, they said this was the most critical factor in their recovery, even though they fought me the most on it, and, and they just didn't want to have that as part of their aftercare plan. So four is nurturing relationships. They talked about how it is sometimes easier to be alone. And I know on my eating disorder, I convinced myself that I wanted to be alone on Friday nights, that I didn't want to be out with people. And so I made a rule for myself early on, so I'll just disclose it all to you, so now you know if you invite me to do something, I'll have to come. And so my rule is, is that if I'm invited to a social event, since I'm such an introvert and I'm so anxious, that if you invite me to a social event and I don't have plans, I need to go. Whether I want to go or not, that I have to push myself and do those things. And then I always en um, end up, you know, enjoying myself. But So I talk to my patients about setting some some goals and some rules for themselves if they have that anxiety and they have that social anxiety. So the next one is five, um, is sleep schedule. And you may say, why do we care about our patient's sleep? But that's a really important um, one for me. I like to know how often they're sleeping. I like them to have a sleep schedule. And I'll give you an example of this. If, if I'm working with a 16-year-old and on Friday nights she stays up till, you know, 2 a.m. Saturday morning, and then she sleeps in till 11. Well, that's great because that's what my 16-year-old does at home. But my 16-year-old doesn't have an eating disorder. And I still, and I can't control my 16-year-old. But for my patients, they seem to listen to me more. So what I say then to that 16-year-old patient, okay, well, you just woke up at 11. When are you going to eat breakfast then? Should you eat breakfast? Do you just now eat lunch? Do you have a snack? And so you can see how their meal plan gets completely off um, if their sleep schedule is off. And then I guess our, our hunger cuneus folds are off if our sleep is off. So I tell them that, you know, one of the luxuries of recovery is that they have to have a sleep schedule and they can't be like a normal teenager or a normal college student. And so I give them some leeway on the weekends, but especially at first that sleep schedule is crucial. So the next one they identified or arbitrary um, recovery timelines. So again, they just expected that they would recover. And I think for so many of them, they think, and, and this was, I was guilty of this too. I thought that once I actually decided I wanted to recover, I would just recover. And so, so often um, they feel that pressure. And then if you look down on the slide too, you see the family has the pressure to recover them or for them to recover now. And, and no offense against any of the dads that are listening, but dads sometimes seem to be the most guilty of this, especially my physician dads. They, I've literally had multiple physician dads drop off their daughter and say, you're going to fix her, right? And she's going to be recovered when she's done. And so these, these dads do um, learn really quickly that it's not just like having a surgery or giving them a prescription and things get better and they start to understand, but there is a lot of pressure for these young women and young men, of course, to get better and to get better fast. And the family has spent a lot of resources on their treatment and they kind of expect that you're going to do well and, and we need you to do well. And so for a lot of them, they have, they say they, so they don't even want goals or timelines about recovery, recognizing that they need to have some goals and timelines. But the, the next one you can see, they say too many expectations are taking on too much. So many of these patients already feel like, well, I've missed so much of my life or I've already dropped out of college two times or I've had to take a leave of absence and I've missed so much so I need to go back and take 19 credits and, or I need to take four AP classes. And so it's really hard for them to maybe realize that they need to lower their expectations. And believe it or not, I actually do groups with them where I teach them, I want you to learn to be average. I don't want you to be this high, high achiever because maybe being a high, high achiever is going to completely conflict with your recovery. 
So talking about realistic expectations. And then if we're going to work really hard on recovery, that's going to have to come first. And, and school may not come first. Um, and, and parents need to know that too. It's always interesting this time of year we see so many admissions because so many of our patients really, the hope is, is I'll get back in school, I'll get back in college, I'll get back in high school, and I'll get the structure and I'll do better with my eating disorder. Well, come October and November is when they start to crash because they've taken on too much, they're in too many AP classes, and, and they're struggling. So the next um, slide has my interventions um, for this kind of taking on too much. And, and the, the irony of the burnt down house is my roommate from college, who is where I had my eating disorder, she lives in Napa, and her house, she let me know her house, she lost her house this week. So I apologize for my slide because um, I know I know she might be listening and she she's having a bad bad week losing her home. But I like this analogy and, and what I kind of told her in my Facebook message is, is it this similar analogy that I use for patients. And I talked to them about in my recovery I built this beautiful home. And I it was my recovery home, and I, I thought I was doing everything right, and I put a white picket fence up, and I planted flowers in the yard. And three months into my recovery, I burnt my entire recovery house to the ground, and I completely relapsed, and I engaged in all my behaviors, almost worse than I ever had. And so one of my patients told me, well, Nicole, I not only burnt my house down, but I burnt my whole neighborhood down when I relapsed. I took everyone out with me. And so what I like to talk to the patients about is just because we relapse or we have a lapse and we go back to behaviors, which I did three times the first year of my recovery, um, that we can rebuild that house again. And we still have the blueprints and we still have the foundation. That foundation is there. That knowledge we learned, it doesn't go anywhere. And so I tell them, let's build the house again. Let's build it different. Let's build it stronger. Let's build it better. That's no guarantee you're not going to burn it down again, but we have to keep on trying. And so, again, talking to the family about this, letting the families know that recovery is a process and it takes time. And part of that time is, is self-correction, learning what went wrong, and, and to keep on going. And so I do appreciate that analogy because I feel like for me, um, it was a big deal. And, and then maybe setting more realistic goals. Okay, so the next one they said was a huge barrier was perfectionism. And again, feeling like I had to be perfect at my recovery. So many of my patients, when they, when they have a lapse or a relapse, they say, well, I didn't want to tell anyone. People would be so disappointed. Everyone thought I was doing so good, Nicole. Um, melting down if they made mistakes. Um, that's something I see on the unit all the time. Um, patients make simple mistakes and, and you know, they, they decompensate. They're in tears. They have such a hard time with failure. Um, and again, too high of expectations for myself, feeling that I needed to have a perfect life. I think this has gotten so much worse with social media. I see so much comparing. If some of you, again, have seen me talk on social media, the, the reason I got so into the research on social media is I found for myself I was going on Facebook and I was feeling insecure. I was I was like comparing to I guess all, all of these professionals lives and everyone that their husband was giving them flowers, their kids were winning awards, they were all going on vacation and I just thought my life sucks. It's not nearly as exciting as everyone else's and so you know reminding our patients that there's, there's a lot of people present a different life um, on social media and, and that perfect life just doesn't exist. So for the intervention I like to talk to my patients about perfection, perfectionism versus excellence and talking to them about that and I really love um, a lot of Brene Brown stuff and I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about shame but um, you know she talks about being a recovered perfectionist and I like to talk about myself that way too and, and looking at how we get away from perfectionism and we move more to excellence and so this slide I think kind of really shows the difference and so I, I like to share that with them and talk about how they can open that more in their life 
and move more towards excellence. So the next one they said five was shame. And they said dwelling on my past mistakes, assuming everyone is judging me. And, you know, there may be some truth in this. For a lot of our patients, they have disappointed a lot of people. Maybe they have a lot of people in their lives that have given up on them. And so, you know, I don't try to sugarcoat that with them. I say, yeah, that, that maybe's happened, but we're going to move forward. We're going to acknowledge that maybe you do need to gain back some trust with some of these people in your family. And then, of course, guilt and embarrassment about their behaviors. I think it's so interesting. Since I'm so open about my past, I find that the patients are more open about their past, especially when it comes to purging behaviors. My patients are pretty pretty quick to, to report that they like to restrict, but if you ask them in groups if they binge, if they purge, less hands go up until I share that, oh, well, that's in my history. Because, again, the, the shame and the embarrassment and the guilt about their behaviors it is overwhelming. And then, again, they, they isolate, they're lonely, and then they say, I'll never be good enough. There was a body image um, study a couple years ago, and they asked women um, kind of their, their top two negative thoughts about themselves. Well, of course, the, the number one thought was, I'm fat. But the number two thought, and it's really the most important thought, was I'm not good enough. So I always tell them that the thought underneath I'm fat or I need to lose weight is ultimately I'm not good enough. No one loves me. No one cares about me. So for shame interventions, um, the first one I like to do is sharing their eating disorder autobiography. So we have them write, um, I, I make them do a typed 8 to 10 page eating disorder autobiography. And in this biography, I tell them to put the nitty gritty details they would never want anyone to know. I say, tell me the worst things you did in your eating disorder. Tell me the things you wouldn't want people to know, whether it was stealing or what you were binging on or where you would purge or how you would lie or you would manipulate. I have them write that all down and I have them share it. And the reason I want all of those details, and they share it with their therapist, and a lot of times they share it with their spouse and their families. Um, but the reason I want all those details is because I need that document to be a reminder to them in the future when they are telling me their eating disorder wasn't that bad. So I say, pull out your eating disorder auto. Let's review that today in session. Since you're telling me that you think you can go back to these behaviors and it's not going to be that bad and you're going to control it better, um, let's read your eating disorder autobiography again. Let's remind yourself of how miserable it was. Of course, Brene Brown's book, um, Gift of Imperfection, is excellent. She has some really good TED Talks that I assign the patients as homework to watch as well. Um, there's also some values assignments I like to do where I'll go online, and again, you can, you can go print just core list of values, and, and there's lots of websites that just have core list of values. So then I identify, have them identify their top 10 to 15 values. And then I say, okay, let's, let's put these in a hierarchy. And how are you right now in your life every day? How are you living towards these? And if you're not, how come? And is the eating disorder getting you any closer to these values? So number six they have is unhealthy relationships. And so if you kind of look at this one, it's family members dieting, roommates with eating disorders, keeping their eating disorder friends, unhealthy you know, work environment. So I have them really look at their friendships, look at who they're staying in relationships with. I like to talk to them about their friendships. And then again, I, a lot of times I put them in social skills groups, having them learn new social skills, setting boundaries, holding those boundaries. Okay, we don't have questions. Good. I'm going to finish because I have two more i got to get to really quick. So number seven is isolation. Again, lack of fulfilling, you know, friendships. They're not close to anyone, being alone. We've talked a lot about that. So here are some of the assignments I give them. So number one, social assignments. I might send them to the mall and say, you need to make eye contact with 50 people, and I need you to verbally say hi to at least 10 people. 
I might put them in community classes. Just anything to get them out, joining rec groups, anything I, they can do. I told them I used to go to water aerobics because I hated my body so bad when I was in recovery. And I was in there with a lot of older women that were so kind and nice to me that it was fabulous. And then limiting their internet and their social media. We talked about that one earlier. So the very last one I want to talk about is dishonesty. I love this. It says lying is done with words and also with silence. And so I like to remind my patients of that. It's just because I don't ask um, doesn't mean you don't need to tell me. So I need them to tell me what behaviors they're doing. I need to know about their secrets. Um, because a lot of times they lie about everything. And I lied about everything. So this comes now to the interventions. So I have a rule, and this was my own rule, and it's called the 24-hour honesty rule. I made this rule for myself in recovery because I was such a big liar. And I lied all the time. And even when I tried to be honest, I couldn't. Um, well, at least that's what I said. So my rule was, if I lied to someone, I had 24 hours to be honest about that lie. I didn't have, if I lied to Tamara, I didn't have to be honest with Tamara, but I had to tell someone that I lied to Tamara. So I tell my patients that is the same thing I expect of them. So we try to get that 24 hours down, and then I start to slowly trim down the time. And I could say, okay, within eight hours. And I like them to pick an accountability person. And again, that person could be me. They may have to email me who they've lied to and what they've lied about. And then I tell them, OK, what's the self-correction? So I'm big on self-correction. I don't care that much about their behaviors. I care more about their self-correction. So if you purged, what did you do to self-correct? If you binged, what did you do to self-correct? So here on Wednesdays at the center, Patients have a meal, it's called a recovery directed meal, where they can eat or not eat and there's no consequence. So a patient just came but right before I walked in here and she said, Nicole, I didn't even eat at the Wednesday meal and was kind of smirking at me like she got away with something. And I said, okay, well, I want to know in the next hour when I get done with my webinar what your self-correction is. And so again, I'm not going to focus that much on the behavior, but what did you do to self-correct? So anyway, I want to thank you guys so much for um, taking an hour out of your busy day um, to, to listen. So I hope you learned something from me today. So again, it's just a privilege um, that you would spend an hour with me. And um, thank you so much for tuning in. And I think Tamara just has one brief um, announcement. I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Nicole. That was amazing. Just a reminder, I know there were several, uh, many of you who, who um, logged in just a few minutes after the top of the hour, so you might not have heard all of the instructions. So just a reminder that um, at once the webinar ends here in just a minute, that you should immediately have um, an evaluation pop up. If you would just take 30 seconds to fill that out, that would be really helpful for us. That's a, a continuing education requirement. That would be um, uh, helpful for us to be able to, to send that to our CE providers. And then um, about an hour or so after the webinar ends, you will get a separate email um, with instructions uh, how to take the post test. There'll be a link for you to click on and you take the post test online. And once you pass that, um, then it will automatically download the certificate, the CE certificate for you once you take the test and pass it. So watch for that email in about an hour or so. Um, and then um, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you again for participating today. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.